He's a senior research fellow and he's a director of the Centre for the Resolution of Intractable Conflict. What was that? Oh, that's a name for something. <laughs> at Harris Manchester College in Oxford. He's a clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Maryland and chairman for the Centre for Democracy and Peacebuilding in Belfast. As leader of the Alliance Party of Northern Ireland for 11 years, from 1987, he played a significant role in negotiating the 1998 Good Friday Agreement. He was the first speaker of the Northern Ireland Assembly, and from 2004 to 2011 was appointed by the British and Irish governments as one of four international commissioners overseeing security normalisation and terrorist demobilisation. This involvement on the security front continued with his appointment by the First and Deputy First Ministers of Northern Ireland to help produce, earlier this year, a report on disbanding paramilitary groups. Formerly President of Liberal International, a global federation of more than 100 liberal political parties, he is now President of Honour. He was a consultant psychiatrist in psychotherapy in Belfast. He continues to consult, mediate, negotiate, teach, and write on fundamentalism, radicalisation, and violent political conflict around the world. He's been recognised with many honorary degrees and prizes, including the International Psychoanalytic Association Award for Extraordinary Merit of Service to Psychoanalysis, the World Federation of Scientists Prize for the Application of Science to the Cause of Peace, Liberal International's 2015 Prize for Freedom, and many other honorary degrees and fellowships, too many to mention here. I'm very grateful to him for agreeing to speak today. As both a politician and a psychotherapist, I'm sure he has particular insights, and I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say. Thank you. Well, Madam President, William, Jerry, friends and colleagues from across the island, it's a very great pleasure to be back here. My wife and I uh, decided to move house to, to Oxford uh, about a year ago. Um, one day she said to me, uh, John, you're never here. The children aren't here. The grandchildren aren't here. Why am I still here rattling around in Belfast? And so we decided that we would move over uh, to, uh, to Oxfordshire because I spent a lot of time at the university and, uh, and at Westminster. And I was very honoured indeed to be invited by President Wendy Byrne to come and give this lecture and of course delighted to come back to Belfast to do it. Um, I'm giving a lecture on conflict, cooperation and complexity. And it might seem pretty obvious to say that conflict and cooperation are, are difficult and complicated things, but complexity is more than simply complication. Now, given the situation at the moment, I'm, I'm sorry we're not going to get away without mentioning Brexit. When I was coming over here uh, on the tube, it said, don't mention the B word unless the rest of it is Barbados. <laughs> I'm sorry this isn't a lecture about Barbados, it's a lecture about complexity. Now, what was the whole European project? Well, it, it was, of course, about how we deal with conflict. Uh, after two world wars, which started in Europe and spread right across the globe, and huge, huge numbers of people were, were killed. And it ended uh, with nuclear bombs, which threatened the very survival of our species. Uh, and, and in all the talk about climate change in the last while, people have not been talking so much about the nuclear threat, even though it is right back on the agenda in a way that it hasn't been for more than a generation. But at that time, in 1945 and afterwards, people in Europe said, we've got to make sure it never happens again. And so, both practically and symbolically, they seized on a very interesting idea, particularly Monet and Schumann and uh, Adenauer. They said, let's take coal and steel, which is what we've made the weapons with that we've used to kill each other, and let's turn those, instead of the materials for conflict, let's turn them into the basis for cooperation. So the European coal and steel community was formed, but that was always meant to be an instrument for the healing of disturbed historic relationships, because that was fundamentally the problem. Relationships in Europe 
between France, Germany, Britain, Italy, and other countries had been difficult, tempestuous, and turbulent. They had been disturbed for generations, for hundreds of years, repeated wars which simply got more and more and more serious until we developed the technology where a war could bring an end to all of us. And they said, we, we, must, we must try to find a way of working together. And so they said, let's, instead of allowing ourselves to get into nationalistic wars, let's pool sovereignty, let's put our, 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 our opportunities together, we'll work across the borders rather than those being the places where we start to fight. And they identified four freedoms, freedom of movement of people, uh, goods, capital and services. And they said, let's allow those to be free across Europe. It'll take time, it'll take a long time to, to develop it, but let's, let's do that. And in the doing of that, uh, three other major things happened. First of all, the euro was developed. So a common currency to make it easier to trade across borders. Uh, an ever closer union, again, in order to uh, pull that sovereignty in a constructive and workable political way. And finally, uh, it, it gave a, a, a place at the top table of global affairs for small and medium-sized countries, which was what Europe is made up of. Uh, it really wasn't possible after the end of empire for countries like France and Germany and Britain and Italy and so on to take their place at the top table with what then was the Soviet Union uh, and the United States of America. But altogether, here was a possibility. That wasn't something that was felt very important by ordinary people, but believe me, it was felt to be important by politicians. And so uh, this whole European project developed, and it was really quite an inspiring one because uh, people who had been at war repeatedly, as time went on, were cooperating, engaging with each other, and, and so on. It became a very inspiring thing. And indeed, when, when in Ireland here we began to look at the question of our conflict, which had gone on generation after generation, keeping coming back, one of the things we went, began to look to was the example of the European project. And famously, John Hume, the leader of the SDLP, would say, you know, the Germans can still be Germans, the French can still be French, but we can all be Europeans together. We can cooperate on our social and economic best interests, and, and that can change the relationships. Again, it's about dealing with transforming disturbed historic relationships. It's not fundamentally about borders and policing and, uh, and, and so on. It's about disturbed relationships between peoples. And, and if I could just say, when you start working with people, with, with, with families, with, with couples, and even more particularly with, uh, with conflicts internationally, it's very difficult to not become partisan for one side or the other. But the truth is the problems are problems of relationship. You go to work with Israel and the Palestinians, or you go to work with uh, India and Pakistan over Kashmir, or indeed you go to work with a couple who've got a problem in their relationship. You almost immediately find yourself being attracted to one side and, and opposed to the other side. Well, actually the real problem is this side, or the real problem is the other side. Actually the real problem is the relationship between the two. And if you focus on that, it enables you to be a constructive contributor. Because if you put back one side against the other, you're simply part of the problem. And so we began to understand that this was about disturbed relationships. It wasn't just about unionists and nationalists in the North. There were other sets of relationships that were important too, and we identified three key sets of relationships between Protestant Unionists and Catholic Nationalists in the North, between North and South, and between Britain and Ireland. And there were other relationships with Europe and the United States that were important, but these were the three key ones. So the whole peace process developed in a very different way from any other peace process anywhere in the world. It focused not just on the immediate uh, partisans, if you like, but on the wider sets of relationships. And the process itself was set up with three strands, one to deal with each of the disturbed relationships. And the strand one, the Northern Ireland strand, had the representative of the parties in the, in the North here and uh, the British government because it was the Southern government. But when it came to North-South, you have to introduce the Irish government. And when you come to East-West, you shouldn't have the Northern Ireland parties there at all. It's between Britain and Ireland. And, and this new way of working raised all sorts of possibilities that frankly hadn't been there before. And of course, as you know, we came to the Good Friday Agreement with three sets of institutions representing the three strands that represented the three sets of relationships.
Of course, there were also other things within that. The transformation of, of policing was one, protections, human rights protections all around, and so on. But the key thing was the building of new relationships on a basis of respect, fairness, and democracy. And, and from my point of view, uh, that psychological dimension of things was absolutely critically important. In fact, if you look at why the institutions have broken down or are not working satisfactorily now, it's not because there's a problem with the institution. It's because there's a problem with the relationships. And the problem with the relationships was that people stopped paying attention to them. Because relationships aren't something you can settle. If you think you've got a good relationship with somebody and you can just leave it there uh, and, and accept that it's sorted, it's already in trouble. Because relationships are organic things that you've got to be always working at and nourishing. And they're happening in a context which is always changing and needs to be refreshed and redressed all the time. And, and even the things that you might not immediately think are related to the Good Friday Agreement, like the notorious Brexit backstop, the reason there was a problem between Britain and Ireland was because for 10 years the British and Irish governments weren't fulfilling their strand of the Good Friday Agreement. They weren't meeting together. So while Tony Blair and Bertie Ahern knew each other very well, and Albert Reynolds and John Major worked extremely closely together and were good friends, Theresa May and Leo Varadkar didn't know each other at all. And when they eventually had to meet with each other, and neither of them seemed frightfully eager about it, all the responses that I got back was that the meetings were terrible. Not that they fell out, they just didn't fall in. They didn't relate with each other at all. And of course that's crucial because if at the top the relationships aren't there, it filters all the way down. So this question of relationships built on respect, fairness, and democracy is absolutely critical, and I will come back to that a little bit later on. But why Brexit? Why, why did it happen? Well, it seems to me it happened because there was an increasing sense of distance and disenchantment with decisions made at the European level. It's the case in all organizations that if they're of any size at all, one of the great challenges is maintaining the contact and confidence between the people all around the country on the ground and those at the centre who are office holders of various kinds. And this was the case in Europe. And the larger Europe got, the more people felt distanced from it. But secondly, there was a loss of faith in the authorities themselves. People began to believe that they weren't delivering this, the things that they said they would, would deliver. And in particular, there was huge anger about widespread corruption. The sense that people weren't being honest, that what they were doing and delivering was more in their interests. Not necessarily only financial interests. There are other kinds of corruption uh, as well. But there was this strong sense amongst people that it, it wasn't good, it wasn't right, uh, it wasn't what they wanted to see. And the increasing international trade and travel and the development of new and disruptive technologies, while that's very positive and exciting to, to a percentage of the population, it's very troubling to many others. Probably for the vast majority of people in, in this room, the idea of being able to move about and trade and travel and have relationships with people all around the place and have exciting new uh, pieces of technology to use is almost universally positive. That's probably true for about 20, 25% of the population. For the rest of the population, they find it increasingly worrying and difficult. They're quite happy that they can go and visit somebody else, but when somebody comes and lives in their country and begins to change the culture of that country, that's very troubling and difficult. Where there are some kinds of technology that you can get the handle on and use, there are lots of others that really, really frighten people. Uh, we spent quite a lot of time at, uh, at a home in, in Burgundy, and we've just got a new uh, little piece of technology in called Linky, which, which means that instead of us having to have somebody from the electricity company come around and read it, they can read it electronically. Perfectly simple, nothing to be frightened about there at all. I was talking to somebody yesterday who comes from one of the other villages, and they were saying that the village is on strike. They absolutely won't allow this to happen. Why? Because somebody told them that if you put this in, the electricity company could find out all sorts of information about you and put on a camera and all sorts of things. Many of the things completely untrue, but that's not the point. The point is people get very frightened of things they don't understand very well. And so the whole development uh, within Europe ran into these kinds of problems and so you got a growth of nationalism in pretty nearly every country in Europe. We may focus on the parts of it that relate to us in these islands, but in every other country the politics is changing in a difficult way. This isn't the first time this happened. 500 years ago, 
you had a very similar kind of development. Now, this is a, this is a book about Martin Luther by Eric Erickson, so we need a psychological appraisal of the man. But the problems were very similar kinds of problems. People increasingly felt disenchanted with the authorities. Profound sense of anger about corruption in the Catholic Church, including over the question of money and the sale of indulgences. A sense that there were new disruptive technologies. Now, you might not think that printing is a disruptive technology, but when Gutenberg invented it in the later part of the 15th century, it became increasingly troublesome. I can imagine that there were lots of bulwarks of society, like yourself, sitting around tables like this, drinking their, their wine in the evening, saying, this printing's a dangerous business, you know. All sorts of people will be able to serve all sorts of things, and we're still. Luther translated the Bible into the vernacular, into German. And Wycliffe did the same in English. All of these people who don't understand Latin, and they're going to be able to say all sorts of things, and it's going to completely upend society. And you know what? They were right, it did. It led to the wars of religion. Why? Because it, it, it created change that some people wanted and some people didn't want. And the particular change that it created was a fundamental shift in the seat of authority. It wasn't any more a question of authority lying in the church, uh, in kings or in bishops. Uh, it wasn't a matter of their interpretation having to be accepted by ordinary people. In fact, on the contrary, Luther's proposition was that every man, and of course in those days it was simply every man, it took a long time to be every man and woman, but every man had the freedom, the facility, and the responsibility to read and interpret the scriptures for himself. Well, it was never quite as complete uh, as that, but that was the proposition. And if everybody has the right and responsibility and possibility of reading things for themselves and having their own thoughts, it becomes very difficult for authority to be maintained. So it was a profound shift in authority. And things went on. This, uh, this uh, picture of Galileo, some of you will uh, recognize because it's a statue at the front of Queen's University inside the Lanyon building. And, and Galileo uh, brought another disruptive technology. He developed the telescope. You could actually look up into the sky and really see what was there and then begin to think, well, what does that mean? And what became clear to him was that despite what all the experts of the church and elsewise said, other than Copernicus who had come immediately before him, the earth was not the center of the universe. It wasn't even the center of the solar system. Um, well, this was another shock. This was another move away. The seat of authority did not lie uh, in the church, but the, the center of the universe did not lie in the earth. It was way beyond that. And that began to change things too because what he was saying was we need to do experiments, we need to make observations in order to see what the truth is. And it took hundreds of years for the establishment to entirely accept that. I remember going to an exhibition a number of years ago in one of the churches in Rome, which was an exhibition of Galileo's instruments. Finally, the church had come to the point and said, well, you know what? We got it wrong with Galileo. But you can see why. Because it upended the social order. It changed things enormously. And it didn't end there. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, Luther came from Germany. And Galileo came from Italy, Descartes came from France. He couldn't stay there a lot of the time, he had to move around because he was saying some very disturbing things, uh, not as a theologian or uh, as an astronomer, but as a philosopher. And uh, he, was, uh, he was pointing up that uh, from a philosophical point of view, uh, you had to break things down into their fundamental parts and understand them at that kind of level. Divide all the difficulties under examination into as many parts as possible, just as Luther was saying, break it down so that every individual understands it. And Galileo was saying, break it down into its experimental parts. Descartes was saying, philosophically, break the problems into as many parts as possible uh, in order to solve them and, and to conduct his thoughts in a given order, beginning at the simplest and most easily and gradually ascending step by step to the more complex. And of course, he separated off the mental and the physical. Now that was extremely helpful in very many ways. It made it possible to do experiments using the kinds of principles that had been developed by Galileo and, and others before and since. And so it was really very helpful, but as we'll see, it also introduced problems. Well, here we come to an Englishman, Newton. 
he took the ideas further. He said, yes, nature is, is extremely simple and conformable to herself. Whatever reasoning holds for the greater motions should hold for the lesser ones as well. God in the beginning formed matter in solid, massy, hard, impenetrable particles. You remember that? You learned that at school, Dalton's atomic theory. And if you'd said that it was any different from that, you would have failed the exam. By the time you got to the later part of school in the beginning of university, if you still said that atoms were indivisible particles, then you would fail the exam, because of course we know that they're not. But we can split phenomena, he said, into fundamental elements, and so, on those fundamental elements, build up a complete understanding of the physical universe. But he understood that this wasn't the whole answer. You know, lots of people talk about those aspects of Newton, um, but they don't look at lots of the other things that he wrote about. He, he thought that alchemy might uh, prove to be a way forward in thinking. The religious dimension was extremely important to him. And with regard to our kind of work, he said, I can calculate the motion of heavenly bodies, but not the madness of people. However, this separation into physical and the mental and the clarification that if you broke things down, if you analyzed them at their fundamental levels, you could build up a profound understanding of things, led to an enormous move forward in science generally. To the point where when it came to the end of the 19th century, one of the world's most famous physicists said, well, we basically got it's sorted out. We've got to fill in a few things, but we really know pretty much what the answer is to things. We can break things down to the fundamentals, or as sometimes people say to us, but what's really the issue? What really is it about? As though you can break things down and say, well, there's lots of other superficial things, but bottom of it all, here's what the answer is. And then came another physicist. He was a German called Heisenberg. And he began from his calculations and observations to be clear that actually it wasn't anything remotely as simple as that. And that actually you could not, 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 not just practically could you not, but even theoretically you could not measure the exact values of the position and momentum of a particle at the same time. It was the development of quantum mechanics. And what it meant was that in, in principle, not just because you didn't have a sophisticated enough set of experiments, but in principle, some of the things that seem to us absolutely self-evidently the case aren't. It wasn't just complicated, as we'll see, it was complex. He became a very significant character, not just because he won the Nobel Prize in 1932 on the nomination of Albert Einstein, but because he was a German and a German physicist working in Germany during the 1930s and early 1940s. Those whom he had known from before the war, people like Bohr and Paul Dirac and Einstein and so on, and who were advising the Allies, became very worried that Heisenberg was developing a nuclear bomb. And in fact, he was becoming involved in that proposition, though he didn't believe it could be developed uh, until at least 1945, if not after that. But that's one of the reasons why the, uh, the whole project, the Manhattan Project, to develop uh, the bomb in the West went ahead, because his friends and colleagues in science, as well as the politicians and, and military people behind them, became very much afraid that Heisenberg could develop the bomb for the Nazis. And so the only way to deal with that was to try to get there first, the, the, the arms race in a, very, in a very major way. But from our point of view, the key thing about Heisenberg was his uncertainty principle. The, the, the realization that it, it was not linear and simple anymore. And this provoked the development of understandings of complexity. That, that this idea that things had been working on for the previous three, four hundred years, that if you break everything down into its simplest parts, that will tell you what is happening at a higher level, isn't actually true. Because as things evolve and become more complex, new properties emerge which are not predictable on the basis of knowing the previous ones. You can know everything about hydrogen and everything about oxygen, and it doesn't tell you anything about water. And you can know what there is to know about one molecule of water, but it doesn't tell you about wetness. That requires lots more molecules of water. So when you bring things together, it isn't just the sum of the parts. 
There is new information that is created by the structuring of these things at a higher systemic level that produces or allows the emergence of new properties that weren't predictable previously. Now, I began to become familiar with uh, some of these ideas, at least in a simplistic form, when I was working in my first few years in psychiatry because I was dealing with uh, young women, mostly young women, with eating disorders. And I was looking at uh, their trace elements and gut hormones and so on, and also trying various kinds of psychological treatments, uh, uh, psychoanalytic approaches and cognitive approaches. And then I began to realize, you know, I can work with this young woman, and I can do various kinds of things, but when she goes back home to the family, it all goes to pieces again. And, of course, when you saw the family at the start to do your perfectly proper and appropriate psychiatric interview, they would tell you, with absolute earnest sincerity, nothing in the family, everything's wonderful, we get on so well, but we've just got this one little problem, which is this girl with an eating disorder. And it began to become apparent that this one little problem was simply the symptom of all the other problems of relationships in the family. And that the way that you needed to work if you were going to help this individual was actually to work with the whole family system, to bring the family together. Sometimes that meant bringing Granny in because she lived there, or even bringing the dog or the budgie sometimes, because they were kind of important part of the family system. But what was clear was you had a problem at a different systemic level than the individual. In the same kind of way as psychologically things are happening at a different systemic level than the biochemical. And to understand it, to make a difference, you need to understand them at these various levels. Well, of course this was uh, happening in the kind of area of, of work that we do, but it was also happening with the physicists. The guys who had been at Los Alamos in the Manhattan, Manhattan Project, as they began to do their maths, they began to realize that there were levels of complexity that were not addressed by dealing with these things simply. And they, they left uh, Los Alamos and went to Santa Fe and set up an institute there to explore what they call complex adaptive systems. Things that, that function as, as systems that regulate themselves and adapt themselves to properties without there being an obvious cause in terms of a simplistic individual thing. For example, I have a, a lovely uh, photograph that someone sent me a, a year or two ago when they heard I was working on this, of a murmuration of starlings out across Belfast Loch there. And I don't have a slide of it here, but you, you know exactly what it's like. It's these huge numbers of birds flying around, moving to and fro. And if, you, know, you don't look up at that and say, which one's the leader? You know that's nonsense. It's not possible. No individual bird, no bird at all. And how does it work? We don't really know. Uh, the previous speaker was talking about how difficult it is when you can't really help, but it's just as challenging when you don't really know. And there are things like that that we don't yet understand. That's not to say that there is no possibility of understanding, but the way we have of understanding things at the moment means we don't quite understand. But we know that it's not about an individual bird. We know that it's something that's happening at the level of the whole system. And we've begun to appreciate that complexity is more than simply things being complicated. Complexity is when things are functioning in relation to each other systemically. And I've mentioned before this notion of a hierarchy of, of these systems. Well, actually, some of this has been developing in psychology for a very long time. Uh, people are aware of psychoanalysis and its evolutionary notion of the development of the individual right from the start on. Uh, but, but those have their roots in the work of Hulings Jackson, the father of uh, English neurology. He, when he was working from a neurological point of view, demonstrated how we start off with simple reflex actions and reactions. And then as time goes on, those become inhibited by higher functions, which allow a degree of complexity in, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and difference in the way that we operate. If, if I'm testing somebody's reflex, it's either there or it's not there. But if somebody smacks me on the cheek, there are all sorts of different actions and reactions that I can have at a much higher level. Much of this work um, 
disappeared off into psychoanalysis and really wasn't taken up so much in the more biological approaches to psychiatry. Except in France by a psychiatrist called Henri E, who developed an organodynamic approach to psychiatry, whose basic idea was, in a sense, a, a little bit, a bit like the biopsychosocial models that were fashionable for a while in the United States, that this notion that went back to Descartes, that you could really split off the mental and the physical, was, well, it was a useful illusion, but it wasn't actually the case. These things were absolutely related with each other, and we had to try to find ways to understand a handful of papers. But from the psychological side, he had adopted a lot of the ideas of Heidegger, the existential philosopher, that, that when you're trying to understand a person, for example, it's not just enough to understand their behavior or their actions or their thinking, it's their whole way of being in the world, the whole way that they function in relationship with others, not them as an individual bounded by their own body or their own thinking or their own time. Of course, the work of Heidegger tended to be blighted much as some of Heisenberg's work was because uh, he was thought to be rather sympathetic to the Nazis. And so after the war, uh, there wasn't much given, a thought given to, to his work. But then there were others who developed some of the, these ideas, René Girard, um, and I see Roger Cleland here, and then, uh, he did a lot of work in, in popularizing the work of, of René Girard. Van McVolken, uh, also from a divided island, the island of Cyprus, he was a northern, uh, northern uh, Cypriot, Turkish, and he developed this idea of large group psychology. In other words, you and I as psychiatrists work most of the time with the individual person, and then we start working with couples and families, and then sometimes we treat people by bringing them together in groups of six, seven, eight, nine, ten. But what about the groups of hundreds of thousands or even millions of people? You know, we talk about depression. There are men, almost all men, but not completely, who waken up on a Sunday morning all across the world depressed because Manchester United lost again yesterday. More seriously, there are young Muslims right across the world who waken up extremely angry because a young person in Gaza has been shot. They don't even know necessarily where Gaza is, but they feel profoundly affected by it. And so that notion of the functioning, not just of individuals, small groups and families, but of huge numbers of people with a sense of identity, how do we understand and engage with that? Because for me, that was one of the problems. How, there was no point in, 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 in putting out a press statement saying that Ulster should lie down on the couch. You know, that was not going to be addressing the problems that we have. We need to try to understand at another kind of level and another level of complexity how to deal with these things. So, what do we know then about these, from, from, from the work of these people? Well, first of all, that the evolution of us as individuals moves from the simple, rigid, and predictable to the complex, adaptive, and variable. And when we run into problems, trauma, which may be physical, or psychological, or social trauma, those higher levels of function that we have achieved get lost, and the more primitive levels break through again. So you get this dissolution with a loss of complexity and a re-emergence of earlier and less advanced ways of being in the world. And it's not complete. Uh, it's always a little bit of the progress is kept and some of it is lost and so on. And then you get a natural repair and regrowth of the remaining functions. You know, we, we sometimes talk about ourselves as healers. We don't really heal people. What we do is we try to take away the things that stop the natural process of healing. You know, whenever whenever a, um, somebody comes along with a, a nasty wound, what do you do? You clean it to take away the debris and the dead stuff and, 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 and make sure there's no grit or dirt or whatever. And then you bring the two ends of the, of the, uh, the, the tear together uh, maybe sew them or bind them in some kind of way so that the separation doesn't obstruct the healing. And then the healing either takes place or doesn't take place. It doesn't take place because you do something about the healing. You do something to try to get rid of those things that obstruct the healing. The natural process itself is absolutely critical. And this is hugely important at a community level, at a large community level. Uh, if you completely destroy things and don't enable them to grow themselves, 
then you end up in terrible trouble. Like in Iraq, when the Americans went in, and anybody who'd been associated with the Ba'ath Party, they got rid of, so they destroyed all the structures and didn't allow the re-emergence of any kind of structured, organized society. And so there are hundreds of people being killed almost every day in Iraq, even though ISIS isn't there, Saddam isn't there, Hardy and the Americans are there. It's been destroyed, but nothing has been put in place to help it heal and come together. So, some of the features of complexity and dissolution. Evolution, and by this I mean the development of people, makes possible a cooperative way of being in the world informed by rationality and emotions. I, I remember whenever I started getting interested in this kind of thing, the, the general view of political science was that people were rational actors operating on the basis of their best socioeconomic advantage. It's absolutely not true. And if you believe it, it's a disaster. When the uh, Alan Greenspan, the former chairman of the Federal Reserve, was giving witness after the financial collapse and after he had retired, giving witness to Congress, he said, I believe that all the actors and stakeholders behaved in their best socioeconomic interest, behaved as rational operators. He said, I've discovered it isn't so. And I have no alternative model. I don't understand what's going on. Anybody who's a psychiatrist knew this was nonsense. The idea that people act all the time, or even largely, on the basis of their best rational socioeconomic interests is nonsense. People are hugely influenced by how they feel about things, for better and for worse. And we've got to deal with that. In fact, one of the reasons I came into psychiatry was that it was perfectly obvious to me that all the political science uh, suggestions and analysis for Northern Ireland were nonsense because they were based on this. And I thought, who are the people who understand irrationality and self-damaging behaviour? Well, it's psychiatrists. But can we take that kind of understanding and apply it at a whole community level? Well, for me, that was the interest and the challenge. Dissolution, for whatever reason, means a loss of the complexity, a return to the past, a fusion with the group, rather than being able to function as an individual, and thinking based on a different set of rules. And one of my friends, uh, Scott Atram, has promoted the idea that says, it's, it's not that people in these situations, particularly in existential threat, operate as rational actors based on socioeconomic advantage, but rather they become devoted actors operating on what, they, what he calls sacred values, which is not about religion. The life of my child is a sacred value. It is not susceptible to socioeconomic metrics. You know, if somebody comes along to me and says, John, I, I saw you coming in in your car. I hope you didn't, it's not a very nice one. I saw you coming in in your car, I'll give you 5,000 pounds for it. I say, yeah, I think it's worth more than that. They say, I'll give you 6,000. Okay, done. If you come along to me, however, and you say, I saw your wife last week, I think she's really nice, I'll give you 5,000 pounds for it. I don't say, no, she's worth 6,000. I slap you in the face and say, what kind of person do you think I am? Because there are things, particularly relationships, which are not susceptible to socioeconomic metrics. And so we think about those things in a different way. We actually, it's become clear with some of the work my friends have been doing with functional magnetic resonance imaging, that if you take young people who are thinking about going off to become suicide bombers, it's not the same part of their brain that's functioning. And it functions with a different kind of grammar and syntax, if you like, than in the case where you're operating on a simple, rational, peaceful way of thinking. And there are two dimensions to this that seem to have emerged for me in the work. The first is that when you feel under existential threat as a community, you tend to regress not only to the past, how things were, a better time, chosen victories from the past, chosen good times from the past, but you also begin to think in a fundamentalist way of thinking. Now, fundamentalists across the world all think that they're different. You know, my fundamentalism is different from your fundamentalism. But actually, it's the same way of thinking. Whether you're religious or not religious, it's I'm right, you're wrong, I need to do things to you to make you realize that what I'm saying is right, and so on. That way, that concrete black and white kind of way of thinking is something that happens when people are looking for a degree of certitude in a context where nothing is actually certain. The second kind of way of thinking arises not just where there is uncertainty and anxiety, 
but deep anger, particularly about humiliation and unfairness. You know, we, we can disagree about all sorts of things, but if I shut up early enough for us to have a bit of Q&A and we, you ask a question and I respond to you in a way that doesn't just say I agree or disagree, but humiliates and puts you down in front of your colleagues, there is hardly anything that is more toxic than humiliation. And if we don't meet again for another 20 years, the first thing that you will remember as soon as you see me, or even if you hear my name, may or may not be what I said to you, but it will be how I made you feel and how that's horrible. And the second thing is deep unfairness. When people feel they're deeply unfair, I don't say justice because that's far too legal. I, I, I have two sons and a daughter, they're all grown up with their, with their own families now. But when Stephen and Peter were young, Peter didn't come to him and say, Daddy, Daddy, Stephen's been unjust to me. He said, Daddy, it's not fair. It's felt in here much more than thought of here. And when whole communities of people feel that they've been humiliated and disrespected and they can't find any peaceful democratic way of resolving it, it sets the scene for violence and an aggressive response, not tactical and strategic violence because they think it's going to solve it, but an anger that says, I just won't live with this and I will kill myself if necessary. And that's how dangerous and difficult it is. And of course, we used to think that this was all transmitted from generation to generation psychologically. It's now beginning to look like it's possible that there are epigenetic effects that mean that even if you solve the problem now and address the psychological dimensions of it, that it may well be encoded and transmitted to the next generation. We're not clear about that, but, but it's a, a frightening prospect. So what are the public policy implications of all of this? What's the relevance of all of this then? If I was telling you about how to deal with individual people, and by the way, an awful lot of what I'm saying, I think you probably understand, is very relevant to how you deal with individuals and communities and your ward or hospital or clinic. But what are the wider public policy implications for somebody like myself working in political life? Well, the first one is this. If it is the case that terrorism is not a problem of individual psychology, but of large group psychology, then our whole way of functioning is not going to be effective. Why? Because the way we operate as states is on the rule of law. And law is about identifying who has committed a crime, can you get the evidence, then due process, then you take that person out of society or implement some kind of sanctions. Well, in the case of individual crimes, that may make some kind of sense. But if it's the case that this is not an individual phenomenon, if it's a large group phenomenon, then it's not going to be effective. If somebody has lung cancer, you don't think that the way to solve that is to identify which of the particular cells in their lungs became mitotic at the start. That's not the way you try to deal with it. You try to deal with it at a different kind of level. You try to get people to stop smoking, for example. But you certainly don't try to go back to which was the first cell that became mitotic. That's a pointless exercise. And yet, if it is the case that we're dealing with terrorism by saying there's some individual person who did this, some individual leader, whether it's Bin Laden or Baghdadi or whoever it happens to be, and if we kill them, or take them out in some kind of way, that's going to solve the problem. We're not going to get any good result at all. So this is huge policy implications, this, this way of thinking about things. The second thing is, politicians, and the public generally, are always demanding how we can know what's going to happen and prevent it. And the college had a big problem with Jack Straw when he was Home Secretary because he came along and said, you psychiatrists are not being responsible citizens. You should be able to identify which people with dangerous, disturbed personalities are going to commit crimes before they commit them. And the college made a very sensible response. They said, well, we've actually looked at this uh, Home Secretary and we, we reckon we probably have to imprison about 2,400 people to prevent one crime. Because the truth of it is you cannot predict these things. You can look back in retrospect and understand the connections, but that's not the same thing as being able to say, this is what will happen if we do A, B, and C. Dissolution, disruption, destruction, you can predict. You know if you stick a bomb in the house, you're likely to bring it down. But if you're saying, let's build this house, can you tell me what will happen in it? No, you can't. Uh, that's, you can't predict things at that, at that kind of level. 
And then we come back to where I started with the situation in Ireland and Northern Ireland, that the way to resolve our problem was to analyze the disturbed relationships and deal with those relationships. And this is true at the political level. And one of the problems, of course, that you have is that when you do come up with an understanding of these things and you present it to government, there's a price tag in terms of changing your policy. And I well remember going along to civil service in the Foreign Office and trying to explain a particular political situation. And the answer I got was this. Well, Lord Alder, I said, we agree with you. You're absolutely right. But you, you have to understand that is not what the Prime Minister wants to hear. And we know that from our experience with individual patients. That sometimes we draw things to their attention and it's not what they want to hear. I remember many, many years ago working in Shaftesbury Square as what is an alcohol addiction unit, and a couple came along and I was interviewing the two of them together and he said, and he was the one that was drinking most, and uh, he said, oh, she drives me to drink, that woman, you know? She goes on and on and on, nagging at me. And I, I, I can't stick it anymore, I go out and have a drink. So I said to the lady, I said, is this true? She said, absolutely. I go on and on and on at him. And it doesn't make any difference, you know. And I said, yes. <laughs> so why do you keep doing it if it doesn't make any difference? And she looked at me as though it was the most ludicrous question in the whole world. But of course, the truth was, it wasn't going to be possible to begin to address their relationship unless both of them started to try to deal with things in a different kind of way. And that's one of the big difficulties, is not just the analysis of the relationships in a different way politically, but getting people to the place where they're prepared to accept it. And, and, and usually things have to break down in a bad way. Either you get to what we had here, which was a hurting stalemate, where the IRA knew that they couldn't win, but they couldn't be defeated. And the British Army knew that they couldn't win, but they couldn't be defeated. And eventually some people started to say, you know, we have to find another way of doing this. And uh, a couple of nights ago I was having a dinner with Dennis Ross, who was the negotiator for the United States in the Middle East for many years. And we were talking about the possibilities and he said, well, you know, there is no Middle East peace process now. And that's terrible. But it also opens the possibility for an entirely different way of approaching the problems of the Middle East because everybody knows that everything else has failed. And of course it's very often at that point with individual patients that it's possible to intervene when they feel everything else has failed, I really need to do something. But it's also true at a global level. So, we also need to understand all sorts of other things like the feedback between Systems at different uh, hierarchical levels, there are lots of different, but I can't not come back to Brexit. And I've told it Brexit too, because Brexit one was Henry VIII. He took England out of the Holy Roman Empire, and he didn't risk social economic disadvantage, he risked hellfire forever. And if you go to the opposite side of the river from Westminster to Lambeth Palace, Justin Welby thinks it was a pretty good idea, actually, in the end. So what will happen with Brexit too? Well, who knows? We, we really don't know. One of the lessons of complexity is we can't actually predict. Because there are all sorts of changes happening in the system, out of the system, and so on. But it has many of the same ingredients as Brexit won. Well. Justifiable anger about widespread corruption, frustration with unfairness, broken promises, the undeliverable prospectus of equality. So a new focus on fairness, cooperation, community, a new way of understanding based on complexity and relationships. Maybe that's something that's possible. Maybe that's something we can think about and explore. But a word of warning. Even if it's the right way, Will it lead to peace and stability? Because there will always be those who are going to lose out. Will we find a way forward without another 30 years war? In the context where war could lead to the end of us all, uh, or will we be able to find ways of thinking about these things? If the last century was about physicists, and what they could bring to the table of understanding. We may need to shoulder some responsibility as those who think more about psychology than about physics. When Sadat went to the Knesset as president of Egypt to meet with the Israeli government, 
He said, more than 90% of our problems are psychological. So as citizens, we have our individual responsibility. But as a large group and community of those who have value not just the psychological, but the biological and the sociological, we have a contribution to make, but a responsibility to make it.